I'm here with Gary Young. Today you're going to talk about identity politics. It's actually going to be a big panel with several people on it. I was wondering, could you elaborate on what you mean when you say identity politics and especially identity politics in the US and Europe? Mm. Can you tell us what are the correlations? Well, okay, so first of all, identity politics, uh, one of the problems with it is that it's quite ill-defined, really, and that people can mean by it whatever they want to mean. For some people, it means a very essentialist kind of politics that's to do with the self. So, I am black and therefore I think this. I am female and therefore I think this. Very rarely does it relate to more powerful identities, so we don't talk about white people. I understand something different by identity politics, which is simply um, the kind of politics that does emerge from who you are, not what you do. That's not necessarily an essential politics. So lots of black people differ, for example, on lots of issues. And yet, nonetheless, if we take something like the civil rights movement, um, then large numbers of people were mobilized by the um, by the facts of who they were, because who they were shaped their experience so profoundly that um, uh, that they were mobilized on the basis of their blackness. And um, I would rather just see it for what it is. It's one way in which people can become politically engaged is through their experiences as a result of their identities. That's as true for America as it is for Europe, but because they are different continents, um, the role of identity plays a different role. To be an American is different. has a very different set of prescriptions and framework than to be a, um, uh, a European, and then to be black or gay or female in those countries is also different. So... Um, uh, I think what we're going to talk about are the, the contradictions and the complements in those two. Do you actually think something like a European identity exists? I've heard a lot of talk about European identity, especially now before the elections, mm. uh, because people are actually trying to come up with it. Yeah. But I would argue there's a strong sense of national identity within Europe. So what is the European identity? There are things that Europeans have in common in the way that they see the world, actually. Not all of them, evidently, if we look at this last election, uh, you know, there were considerable, uh, the last European election, there were considerable extremes. And yet there is a, a, a fairly broad consensus about a, name, a range of things that I've just mentioned uh, that would not be true in America and vice versa. Now, of course, there's massive... Differences, Finland, Greece, Portugal, Ireland, very different countries, not least. They will speak very different languages, but even beyond that. But then America is a vast, vast country too. And the difference between rural Vermont and urban Chicago and, um, uh, and Texas uh, and Florida is very, very different. So um, uh, all of these conversations demand some generalization. And then the question, and I think it's a good question that you ask, is whether those generalizations can stand up to any kind of scrutiny. My point was actually that um, I think we see the idea of constructing a European identity that is also supposed to be an identity without borders, in a sense, because we can, mm. as European nationals, move between the countries. Mm. The way that the European Union and all the states that are organized within this union uh, set up rules and regulations um, that makes it impossible for people from the global south, for example, to come in. So I was just thinking the European identity is also something that is highly dependent on not having people from the global south coming in, in a way. So it's highly dependent on something really colonial and very racist. All identities are in no small part contingent on what they're not. Right. To be black is not to be white or not to be Chinese or, or whatever. And then all of them are not just relational but positional. So you can call yourself anything you want, but it has to make sense. I could call myself Chinese if I want. That's my right. 
But if it doesn't make sense, if nobody else believes it, because we're talking about social identities, not personal indulgences. And so to that extent, you can't... Identities have to be organic and they have to be accepted and understood. Europe, that shape-shifting uh, construction, cannot just declare itself an identity and then demand that people think it. It doesn't work like that. I think actually lots of European identities are very regional. The nation state is actually quite new, historically. And we see, among other things, among the nationalist, huge nationalist upsurges, there are also the Lombardy League, the Scottish National Party, the Basque region. There are actually massive regional identities. In regard to the what I would call the kind of global um, gated community that you kind of refer to, I actually think that's not particularly European. As the um, West has become, as the distinction between the West and the global South in terms of economics has become sharper, as the inequalities have grown, throughout the Western world they have thrown up huge barriers to immigration in Europe and, uh, and America, but actually even worse in Australia, for example. Mm. And um, we have an order now, thanks to neoliberal globalization, where um, machines can move freely, money can move freely, but people cannot. So machines have more rights than people. And, um, and so all Western identities are, to some extent, uh, constructed behind that barrier, behind that human barrier and within um, a, a context of wealth. So there is a massive inequality between, um, uh, between the West and the Global South, and therefore immigration becomes a problem as part of that system of neoliberal globalization. But actually also within the West, there are also huge inequalities. So, um, and America being a very good example, where the third world, the global south, actually lives within the West. So black life expectancy in Washington, D.C. is lower than the Glasgow Strip. Uh, the infant mortality of black, uh, for black children in Chicago is roughly the same as the West Bank. Um, and in those communities where large numbers of poor and mostly minority people live, they are policed in ways that would be they're not identical by any manner of means, but they are policed in a military style that would not look out of place in many areas under occupation. Well, I'm not sure if, if it's really about rising right-wing forces within Europe. Looking at France, for example, where the Front National just mm. gained another momentum for themselves. How do we fit that, mm. these moments, these things happening in the narrative of talking about multicultural societies? The nation state is in is in a period of flux and crisis, mm -hmm. really. And um, in the words of Gramsci, he said that the crisis resides precisely in the fact that the um, the old is dying, but the new cannot yet be born. And so, multinational corporations, global finance has more power than the nation state. Mm -hmm. And people aren't stupid; they understand that. And yet, our politics, our democracies have not expanded beyond the nation state. And so we have this deformed situation in which uh, we have governments, but they don't have power, or they don't have sufficient amount of power. And uh, people feel that. Either you look out to the world and try to seek solidarity, or you retreat into your national identity, and you say, I'm French. And this is the thing that I can control. I can't control any of this other stuff. So I'm going to talk about being French, about defending France from the pollution of other people, of, um, uh, of other cultures and, and so on. And that's pretty much, I feel, um, what's going on in not just Europe, but America too, with the Tea Party. It's a very similar uh, expression. And so multiculturalism, which I think is a bit like identity politics. It's one of those things that Uh, people can uh, misdefine or, um, or real define has become a whipping boy for the right 
So the right wing will say, you know, multiculturalism hasn't worked. And I always say to them, what do you mean by multiculturalism? Do you mean the existence of a large number of cultures side by side or some policy? Because most of the time there is no policy. So multiculturalism becomes, in the absence of a decent definition and in the presence of the primacy of culture over anti-racism, and uh, the primacy of culture in an era of in an era of neoliberal globalization, where people have relatively little control, multiculturalism becomes this flashpoint, this um, uh, all anxieties can lead there. Even if when you get there, there's actually nothing substantial to talk about. Uh, to this notion that um, your world is being taken over by a, a um, collective foreign other. Mm. You already mentioned culture, and I would like to shift the discussion a bit to cultural identity, because mm -hmm. that's a concept I think was made of by Stuart Hall, but that's how I know it. Um, and I was just gonna, some of my favorite Stuart Hall quotes, I'm just gonna read it to you, and I would love to hear your, your, your ideas about that. He wrote that um, identities are the names we give to the different ways we are positioned by and position ourselves within the narratives of the past. Mm. What would you say to that? Yeah, that's about right. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Stuart. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we are, we are born into, ident our identities precede us. We are born into them, most of them. Well, actually all of them. We are, we are born into them. So um, there was a Britain before I was born that made me British. There was a blackness before I was born that made me black. And so I'm born into these, um, uh, these frames. I have a personal choice about what I want to make of those frames, but um, I don't get to choose most of them. Power has many parents, but the brutality it takes to acquire it is always an orphan. So the fact that look, people will say, we British people will say, we won the war, or uh, we won the World Cup. But they will never say, we enslaved people. Uh, and they will say we won the war even if they didn't fight. They'll say we won the World Cup even if they weren't playing. But when you say, well, then you enslave people, they say, oh, I wasn't there, it had nothing to do with me. Mm. And so there is a very selective way in which people, particularly powerful people, choose which narrative they are going to write themselves into. Yeah, I think that's especially true also for, let's talk about German colonialism, because within Germany, of course, there's a strong narrative about the 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 world war in Nazi Germany, but there's absolutely no narrative uh, about German colonialism. So when you ask a German person about colonialism and having colonies and enslaving people and committing genocide in Namibia, for example, nobody will know or they will pretend not to know. And the answer will be like, oh, we didn't do that. Those were the British and the French. We weren't there. So just referring to what you just said. Yeah, well, and because it depends on the power on the power of the people that you pick a fight with. So when you pick a fight with England, France, America, they have the power to make you remember, mm. to force that memory on you. When you pick a fight with black people in Namibia, they probably don't have the same kind of power to force that, uh, uh, that reckoning, which is one of the points that I try to make in my book about the speech is that uh, we only... History is not some benign set of choices where, um, um, where people just write what happened. You know, it's not, uh, object, it's not an objective process. People choose what history they're going to record, and then they choose how they're going to record it, and then it is uh, forever or should be forever contested. Still, I feel like, and I would like to hear your thoughts about this, there's the, the dominant German narrative of being German is very inflexible when it mm. comes to identity. Would you agree with that, or what are your ideas? Well, I know in terms of uh, citizenship, 
laws, and this precedes, it doesn't precede race, but it precedes any serious racial conversation or large number of non-white immigrants, that, America, uh, that Germany has always had a sense of an essential German identity. So, you know, there were, just in terms of the blood laws, the blood um, laws in terms of immigration, so you could be born in Germany, but not at one stage, for quite a long time, you could be born in Germany, but not be German. That tells a story, right, about how Germany understands itself as that it's somehow in your blood. It's not in your geography. It's not about where you were born. It's not about where you were acculturated. It's about your heredity. And that's a very big tanker to turn around. And so at some level, white Germans are going to have to reassess also what it means uh, what it means to be German and whether they want that kind of exclusive uh, uh, mythical um, relationship to uh, to the past. How would meaningful integration and meaningful equality, what would that look like in Germany? I think is a, com a, a serious conversation long overdue. Okay. Do you have any suggestions for that conversation? Absolutely not. A single one. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for the interview. Thank you.